Well, um, I'll just get right into it because we have a lot to cover. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about hockey analysis and R um, from a couple different perspectives. So just real quick background about me. Um, I grew up a Philly sports fan. Uh, recently, it was a Wharton undergrad, um, uh, but I graduated last year. And for the last couple years, I was a pretty avid public hockey analyst. Uh, but right now, uh, I'm a quantitative analyst for the Philadelphia Eagles. I uh, just finished my first full season there. Uh, very fun, very cool job, which I cannot talk about. <laughs> so, uh, but in addition to that, I love our, love the tidyverse. Um, and I still talk about hockey from time to time, which is what this is about. Um, and yeah, my R credentials is that I make fun of Python on the internet sometimes. <laughs> so real quick, what is hockey? The best way I can describe it, violent soccer on ice. So you have five skaters, a goalie, uh, 60 minutes to try to get more goals than the other team. I think it's very fast paced, very exciting, and it always feels like a goal can be scored at any time. So when I watch hockey, I feel nervous. Um, if my favorite team, the Philadelphia Flyers, is losing, I'm like, there's no way the other team is going to blow this lead. If they're winning, I'm like, they are certainly going to blow this lead. <laughs> But I am often wrong about things, and I trust data. So I figured we can dig into some NHL play-by-play -play data and try to find out the truth about like blowing leads. And that's a more general problem, uh, which we can talk about in terms of win probability. Um, so Money Puck is a website run by Peter Tanner uh, that posts an updated CSV of shot data, um, really any event uh, in the play-by-play -play for every season, including the most recent one, 2018-2019, uh, which we can access directly in R. He just threw up some code up there. I'm going to post it later. But if you run that, you will get every event from every game in the last season, which I think is pretty cool. And then let's talk about the tidyverse. So we see a lot of our favorite verbs up there, some filters, some mutates. Uh, but essentially, all I'm doing is taking this play-by-play -play data, keeping all the goals, because again, we're talking about leads and win probability, um, and then making sure I'm keeping track of like the running tally of the goals for home, the home team and the away team in each game. Uh, and just for ease of use, I'm going to filter out overtime games. So I'm just limiting it to games that end in 60 minutes. And then so this is what it looks like now if you just uh, use the view command, check it out. This is um, the second game of the season. The first game ended in overtime. But it's uh, Boston at Washington. And we can see that Boston did not have a good time. They lost 7-0. And these are all seven goals and the timestamps for them in seconds uh, for the Washington Capitals. And the next thing we can do is use expand from tidyr, uh, which, like I said, is the MVP of this code. Um, so what it can do is just expand each game so we have a row for every single second um, instead of just the goals. Um, and then we can join in the goal information and then fill in the score lines for all of those intermediate periods where there wasn't a goal scored, but we know what the score is and we know what the lead is. Um, uh, make sure every game starts 0-0. Zero, zero. Um, and then for every second of the game, calculate the lead of the leading team. Uh, and then whether or not that team actually went on to win the game. Um, and that's that. This is what it looks like now. Um, so again, much bigger. So this is just a tiny snapshot of that same game I showed you earlier um, from like the 19th through 29th seconds. And we can see uh, once Washington scores their first goal, um, they you get a one in home goals. And we also see that the lead column goes to one goal and that uh, the indicator for whether the leading team won ends up being one because Washington did end up winning the game. Um, we can use this to just check out some empirical probabilities based on the lead, based on the time left in the game. How often did the leading team actually end up winning the game? Um, and so this is cool. Uh, I love using ggplot, so I'm a fan of this. Um, we can see that in general it makes sense that having a bigger lead is definitely better. Uh, but there's a lot of you know, ups and downs because, again, these are just empirical probabilities. And especially at the very beginning of the game, we don't have a lot of observations of games that like, were like 3-0 within like, a minute. You know, that's very unlikely. So that's why at the beginning of the game, it's kind of all over the place. So I found this a little bit unsatisfying, because um, I think there should probably be monotonic and fairly smooth relationships between the time left in the game and the probability of winning, given that you have a lead. Um, because it feels better to be up one goal with like 
um, 20 minutes left in the game than you know 25 minutes because basically your opponent has more time to maybe make up that lead. Um, and you know I, I fit like a GM smooth through those empirical probabilities, but that doesn't really fix that problem. Um, it's more specific than that. Um, so I have one weird hack to ensure monotonicity, and I did it this way because I love telling people that XGBoost has really easy to implement monotone constraints um, that can fix that problem essentially. So let's start modeling. Let's say, okay, let's get the probability of winning the game based on the lead you have in the time with all this data that we've collected. Um, and we don't really mind getting as close as possible to like the empirical percentages uh, as long as we have these constraints that a larger lead is always better. So we're going to say you're more likely to win if you have a two goal lead versus a one goal lead. And being later in the game, given that you have a lead, is better because the opponent um, has less time to make that up. <laughs> so as I mentioned, having a, a really small learning rate uh, would normally overfit to hell and back. But with these constraints, we don't have to worry about that as much. So this is what it looks like after we model uh, this problem, essentially. But I honestly think about it as closer to smoothing. Um, and you can see that, again, um, we have that monotonic relationship. Um, because it's still a tree model, it's not going to be like, super smooth, uh, but I think it's good enough. Now, one of the things we can do, aside from just figuring out that, OK, like if the Flyers have a one goal lead at the end of the first period, which is um, 1,200 seconds into the game, they have like a 70% uh, chance of winning that game. I think that's too high for the Flyers, but whatever. <laughs> um, we can do things like find the most exciting playoff game. So I, I train this all on the regular season. So one of the things we can do is identify a team in the playoffs that uh, had a really high win probability at one point, a really low win probability at one point, and see the disparity there. And this turns out to be actually a very famous game in this um, postseason, which was uh, the first game of the first round for Columbus and Tampa. Tampa was the best team in the league by some margin. Columbus was the eighth seed. Columbus ended up sweeping Tampa. So they won all four of the first games. Just It was completely shocking. And in the first game itself, Tampa uh, got to a three goal lead um, at, by the end of the first period. Um, and everyone thought, okay, this series is completely over. Uh, but then Columbus managed to score four goals after that um, and win the game in regulation, which was absolutely shocking. So you can see that uh, Tampa's win probability gets near 100% uh, after the first period, after uh, 20 minutes, uh, and then goes all the way down to zero. So this is cool, this is fun. Um, but what's the point? Uh, honestly, there is one. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to. I just wanted to show you guys some tidy verse code. I just wanted to do a thing. It's like not a big deal. Um, <laughs> it's not really that useful for teams. Uh, not everything has to be. Sometimes it's just fun to do some exploratory analysis like this. Uh, but part of my perspective, uh, because I do work uh, for an NFL team right now, I do have some experience in, in other you know, topics as they relate to sports analytics, is exploring what teams actually do find really actionable. So let's switch gears. We're going to talk about the draft, so I just have to explain the draft uh, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, but every year, there is a seven-round entry draft for NHL teams. So every team goes up and picks a player, a young player, that they would like to be able to sign in the future so they can end up playing for their team. And so they're essentially picking the rights to that player. And each team is allocated one pick per round. Um, and for the NHL, if a prospect turns 18 by September 15th of that year, he's eligible to be drafted. And most drafted players are in their first year of eligibility, but one in five are actually in their second or third or fourth. So they might be 19, 20, 21 years old. Um, and in a general sense, um, understanding opposing team draft tendencies and just general trends and stuff can be really useful uh, when trying to make draft decisions because from a team perspective, you want to know what other teams are going to do. You want to know if they've found any potential inefficiencies, things like that. So I have a little snapshot um, of the 2012 draft. This is the third round, so it picks like 62 to 78. Um, and you can see that most of these guys are 18 years old, but three of them um, were 19. And actually, one of those players, Shane Gossespierre, ended up being a very good uh, defenseman for the Flyers. So they do work out on occasion. Uh, last year, so before the 2018 draft, I actually noticed something. Uh, but first, I had to use Arvest, which is amazing, uh, to scrape uh, draft data from Hockey Reference. 
And uh, what I noticed with respect to overage prospects is that the penguins in the last few years had been selecting a lot of them recently, more so than any other team uh, in terms of a percentage of all the picks that they had. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but I also knew that they had really late picks. So the Penguins were competing for the Stanley Cup a lot of the time. That means they were trading a lot of picks so they could get good players right now, so they could be competitive um, you know, right now. And so they had a lot of late picks. And I also um, had this hunch that um, where you are in the draft, um, influences the likelihood of selecting an overage prospect. Because this makes sense, because if you have the first overall pick, you want to get the best guy who like almost certainly wasn't available last year and teams passed on him. So, you know, at the beginning of the draft, people take these 18-year-olds who weren't previously available, this new talent, and then once that's exhausted, then you start looking to other avenues um, for potentially undervalued picks. And we can confirm this by estimating the likelihood of selecting an overager based on the pick that you have uh, by just using a logistic regression. Um, but so I use the R Stan arm package uh, to fit a logistic regression uh, in a Bayesian way with weekly informative normal priors on the coefficients. Uh, you'll see uh, why the Bayes uh, ends up being helpful. And so if we do this, we essentially, for each pick for each team, have a probability that they would use that pick on an overage prospect. If we just sum this up for all of the picks for each team, we can get basically an expected value of all of the prospects of this type that they are going to select. And we can see how many they actually selected. And we can look at the differential. So we can see that uh, Pittsburgh still comes out on top. So all this means is even after adjusting for the relative lateness of their picks in this time period as compared to other teams, they still picked a lot more you know, 19, 20, 21 year olds than we would expect. So the tendency still seems pretty real. And the last thing we can do, and this is why our stand ARM was very helpful, is that we can use the posterior simulations because you know I'm talking about all these picks, but really uh, for the Penguins, that's 21 picks in this time period. So that's a pretty small sample. And they actually selected nine overage prospects. They were expected to select five and a half. You know, we could sit here all day and be like, is nine really different from five and a half? I don't know, whatever. But like <laughs> the way to sort of uh, be more explicit about that is to use the posterior simulations of all of their drafts. Uh, thousands of times and see that, okay, um, you know, just by chance, we would expect that um, they would draft more overagers than they actually did only about, you know, 6% of the time. So it's fairly unlikely. Now, if you want to use like a p-value rule and just like not care about that anymore, you're welcome to do so. But, you know, I think we can see all the shades of gray and know that that still seems pretty compelling given that it's a very small sample. So, um, and you might be wondering why this matters. Um, and I mean, the, the backstory um, behind this project is that um, it's not a very nice thing to do to tell everyone um, what a team may or may not be planning to do. Um, I'm a big Flyers fan, so I thought it'd be funny to mess with the Penguins like this. Um, and so, like I said, I did all of this analysis um, right before the 2018 NHL draft, and I tweeted out all those graphs that you saw. And I said, um, you know, and then I said, all right, so if you want to mess with the Penguins, you know, take this type of prospect that they are known for selecting right before they do. And then the Leafs had the 52nd overall pick in the draft, which was um, right before the Penguins' first pick. Um, and they ended up taking an overage prospect, Sean Dersey, which is relatively unlikely. Um, at that point in the draft. Um, but I thought it was very funny. Um, and like, I'm not gonna, so this is my disclaimer, I'm not gonna take credit for that. Like they, I'm not part of the Leafs, like they have their reasons uh, for doing things that I have no idea what they are. But, you know, if, like from a team perspective, if you were interested in a prospect, one of the things that you would like to know is if any other teams, you know, in and around the picks that you have are also interested in that same prospect so you can decide when to take him. So this is why um, a project of this scope um, is really helpful for um, 
just uh, informing decision making better from a team perspective. All right, so with that, thank you so much for listening. Um, I will tweet out the slides, code, data uh, for kind of both perspectives that I showed there on Twitter. Um, I wanted to shout out the two data sources that I use, Money Puck and Hockey Reference, for making this data really readily and painlessly accessible to the public, which I think is so great. Um, and I didn't talk about this, but um, you know there are a lot of quote unquote advanced hockey stats um, and a really thriving public community for them. Um, and if you're interested at all in all of that, I would encourage you to check out um, any of these sources that I've listed, Corsica, Evolving Hockey, Hockey Viz, and Natural Stat Trick to learn more about uh, just in general what uh, data analysis, hopefully in R, uh, can tell you about hockey. All right, thank you.